Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the John Radcliffe Hospital and to one of the Biomedical Research Centre's public lecture series. And this is uh, a very special lecture because, of course, it falls in the week celebrating the 70th anniversary of the National Health Service. And so it's, it's my privilege this evening as the director of the Biomedical Research Centre, which I'll speak about in a little more detail during my talk, to give maybe a little bit of a retrospective look back at some of the highlights of Oxford's biomedical research and how that has transformed the present day and looks to have a big impact on the future of medical research in, in Oxford. So looking back, Oxford has been a place characterised from its earliest days in medicine by innovators, by researchers and by physicians who were not content to accept the wisdom of the day and wanted to change the way that we delivered care to patients. And so going back to the 1600s, Thomas Willis, of course, was one of the pioneers understanding the, the blood supply to the brain, and to this day we name the circle of blood vessels at, at the base of the brain the circle of Willis. And during his time in, in Oxford, it was... It was Willis who made some of these very seminal discoveries, which we now take for granted. Later on, we uh, recognise individuals such as Richard Lower, based in Oxford, who performed the first blood transfusion all those hundreds of years ago, presaging the routine nature of some of these day-to-day -day tasks that we take for granted in the National Health Service. This was cutting-edge experimental medicine back in the 1600s, and of course took a very large amount of basic science medical research to understand why blood transfusion was sometimes successful and sometimes catastrophically unsuccessful with the immediate death of the patient. Thomas Sydenham described many diseases which are common uh, and in that same century wrote what might be considered one of the first English language standard medical textbooks. And then going through into more modern times, but even now, more than 100 years ago, William Osler, who spent much of his time in Oxford, and of course the name <coughs> of the road at the back of the hospital, Osler Road, is named after him. He was, I guess, one of the pioneers of modern medical teaching. And he was one of the uh, exemplars of a medical leader who understood the need of making sure that medicine, the care of people and patients, was constantly informed by being aware of new medical discoveries and breakthrough in science. And it was Osler who, going back more than 110 years, made the sort of statement that you could easily read in one of the newspapers today. We need an invasion of the hospitals by the universities. And that's because in that period, hospitals were places where clinical care of patients was um, done, where people were treated, and universities were places where academics did research and undertook scholarly activities of research and learning. And he made this comment uh, about England particularly. It suffered sadly from the absence of great medical facilities, and he obviously thought that there were other places uh, in other countries where this was the case. But nowhere is this more evident than the lack of association between hospitals and academic centres of excellence within uh, English universities. And so that signalled the building of a medical research partnership, which I think Oxford has been at the forefront of now for many hundreds of years, but certainly for the last century. And for any medical partnership in research, you need universities and academics and scientists, but you also need hospitals. And the two parts of the partnership have got to be fit for purpose in their own right, but they've also got to have a will and a means of working together in partnership. And of course, Oxford was notable by being one of the relatively smaller cities in our country that benefited from purpose-built hospitals. So going back into the 18th century, John Radcliffe, whose name is given to this building where we're sitting now, in fact, uh, his uh, philanthropy led to the creation of the first purpose-built public hospital in Oxford, which of course served the city for many hundreds of years and is now still part of the fabric of the university. 
And um, so the uh, Radcliffe Infirmary, of course, housed was the General Hospital of Oxford for many, many years, right through until the 1960s. If you had any illness in Oxford, you went to the Radcliffe Infirmary. It was extended. There were new buildings built around it. Um, and that was the place where much of the medical research was undertaken. But because of the size, scale and scope of medical care and medical research in Oxford, we now benefit from much larger hospitals. And those have all been built on the site where there was activity, looking after patients, usually in spacious surroundings, which means we could build large new buildings. So here's a photograph of the John Radcliffe site going back about 120 years. Uh, and in fact, the, the, the site for the John Radcliffe was purchased in 1919 from the then manor house that was located on this site with extensive grasslands and, and garden lands outside the centre of the city. And on that site, there was um, already a small hospital caring for TB patients, which you can see these sanatorium uh, units, pavilion wards, they were all constructed as small separate units so that the patients could be wheeled outside and take advantage of the fresh air, which was considered to be the best treatment for pulmonary tuberculosis at that time. So those small buildings focused on the treatment of TB in their parkland setting, which was purchased by the Oxford United Hospitals, as they later became, enabled the building in the 1970s. This is the John Radcliffe first phase, now known as the Women's Centre, sprang up as a very large modern building located in spacious grounds. And as we see now from the air, this is where the old manor house still is. So those tiled roof buildings, that's the manor house. Uh, pavilion buildings have long been knocked down. This is the JR1 Women's Centre, which you saw being built on the previous slide. We had that, the John Radcliffe Main Building, or the JR2. And in more recent years, we've had the West Wing the newest part of the building with its wonderful atrium and state-of-the-art facilities for patient care, operating theatres, um, etc. But what I want to show you here is not just the, the size of the John Radcliffe Hospital plot, and you can't see it very easily, but embedded within this NHS hospital are University of Oxford research buildings. Some of them are visible. The Institute for Molecular Medicine, one of the archetypal basic science research institutes in this country, led by David Wetherill, is at this part here. We can see research facilities in medical imaging located here. But many of the university's clinical research facilities you can't see on this photograph, and that's because they're physically embedded within the hospital's footprint. And so many of the research facilities in neuroscience in the West Wing, in cardiovascular in the heart centre, in gastroenterology, in paediatrics, in women's health, in uh, many other areas are co-located where clinicians and where patients are receiving treatment. And I think that's been a very fundamental aspect of the development of the Oxford University, Oxford Hospitals relationship over the last 20 years. And in fact, the building site you can see just here in this small triangle plot is another research facility that'll be opened in the coming years through the university to underpin research in stroke medicine. The Churchill Hospital is similar in its history. It began life as a US Army hospital going back to the Second World War and was populated by US and British troops early on in the 1940s. This is Lady Churchill meeting nurses at the Churchill Hospital in 1942. And in 1948, at the formation of the NHS, the Churchill Hospital was, was passed over to the National Health Service. And these are some of the wards. This is the hospital pharmacy at the Churchill Hospital in the late 1940s, at the time the National Health Service was formed. And of course, the Churchill Hospital has undergone the same striking transformation. A square mile of land, open land, on which some Nissen hut-type structures were built by the US Army, has been transformed into a huge modern hospital. Of course, it's the location of, of the OUH's cancer hospital and many other areas of clinical care for the people of Oxfordshire are delivered through the Churchill Hospital, including renal, uh, renal unit uh, and other major uh, regional facilities. And the Nuffield Orthopaedic Centre, formerly a separate hospital trust, 
um, began life as the Wingfield Convalescent Home, again for people with spinal injuries, uh, spinal deformities, uh, and also TB of the spine rather than pulmonary TB. So TB uh, not only causes lung problems but can uh, involve bone infection leading to long-standing problems. And so the Wingfield Convalescent Home was just that. It was a, it was a, a caring facility, a hospital for people who had long-term conditions and needed long-term convalescence. And it then became the uh, Nuffield Orthopaedic Centre and, and became part of the combined Oxford University hospitals uh, about seven years ago now. But again, the Nuffield Orthopaedic Centre is not just a wonderful state-of-the-art building caring for patients, but has world-leading medical research through the university departments that are co-located on the Nuffield Orthopaedic Centre campus in areas such as bone and joint, the Oxford knee development, joint implants, and very up-to-date state-of-the-art research programmes, um, including tissue engineering, how to grow new tissues to help uh, tissues mend after injury. And in Oxford's history, William Morris, as he began life, founder of the Morris Motor Empire, later Lord Nuffield, was one of our great benefactors to the city. And in fact, in, in the 1930s, Lord Nuffield gave about £2 million to the Nuffield benefaction. And for those of you who are good at working these things out, £2 million in the 1930s is about a billion pounds today. Uh, so that's a very large amount of research funding to help establish medical research, medical teaching, and ultimately the evolution of the medical school in, in Oxford. So the medical school in Oxford, again, goes back through the university's history and departments within the University of Oxford that were specifically focusing on medical research were present long before the inception of the National Health Service. So the Dunn School, for example, um, established in 1927, focusing on pathology, the study of disease, understanding disease mechanisms and how people get disease, uh, was, was present for 30 years before the NHS was formed. And in 1939, just before the war, it was Lord Nuffield's uh, philanthropy that led to the creation, ultimately, of the medical school in Oxford in 1946, just two years before the formation of the National Health Service. So it's symbolic in a way that formerly the medical school in Oxford, within the University of Oxford, came into being as a formal entity at a very similar time to the National Health Service 70 or 72 years ago. And maybe that's why in Oxford we've been able to grow up together National Health Service hospitals and a world leading medical school in a way that, as I'll show later on in my talk, has made some hugely important contributions and world impacts to medical research. But this isn't all about modern day science. Those precedents, those seeds that germinated to generate breakthroughs in medical science, exemplifying this partnership between hospitals and university were already present before the National Health Service. So penicillin, of course, is one of Oxford's most famous discoveries and it was in the Dunn School, the building on South Parks Road, still there today, where the discoveries, the scientific discoveries were made in a research laboratory by scientists studying infection and bacteria. And it was individuals such as Flory who made discoveries, but not only made the discoveries, they overcame the practical barriers to translate them into treatments for patients. So, of course, it was the observation by Fleming that led to the identification that there was a drug that became known as penicillin. But it was Flory who undertook the first clinical trial. And we all know now about clinical trials where people and patients participate in a clinical trial to work out whether a new drug or a new treatment will be effective. In those days, the ways of conducting clinical trials were not well established and there were certainly no regulations or any guidelines. But in fact, when Flory discovered penicillin and was able to purify minute quantities from the penicillin mould, the first patient was a patient within the Radcliffe Infirmary, a policeman who had an infected injury and was on the point of dying from that infection. 
And so researchers and doctors in pre-NHS days worked together to deliver this experimental treatment to this individual. The patient responded amazingly for a few days, but the supply of penicillin ran out. The way that penicillin was then purified was to take the patient's urine and to re-purify the drug from the urine and to re-administer it from the patient. And researchers from the Dunn School in South Parks Road cycled to Woodstock Road to the Radcliffe Infirmary with the penicillin and nurses and researchers cycled back with the jars of urine to re-purify the penicillin. That patient unfortunately died because the, the quantity of penicillin could not be maintained for long enough to save his life. But in fact, the reason I've put Norman Heatley's picture on here and Dorothy Hodgkin's photograph on here is that they were the individuals who added to the discovery of penicillin and worked out how to purify it and ultimately how to manufacture it at a scale that made it available to all patients in the quantities and in the type of tablets that we need to make it a global treatment. So it exemplifies, I think, many things about Oxford, which is it's got brilliant people making amazing discoveries. It's got the ability to test those discoveries in patients and conclude things about what needs to be done next. And it's got the scientists. So Norman Heatley was a biochemist. He wasn't a doctor. And Dorothy Hodgkin, her main contribution is about structural biology, understanding the shape of molecules. She worked on insulin. She worked on vitamin B12, but she worked on penicillin and working out how those structures could be synthesised chemically. And it was arguably these individuals who had just as much contribution to penicillin and ultimately antibiotics becoming a treatment that changed the world forever, even though it was Fleming, Florey and Ernst Chain who got the Nobel Prize at the end of the Second World War. So that signals, I think, just what, how important Oxford's Oxford University's contribution to medicine has been, even in that area. And it's not just discovery science, it's not just bacteria and new molecules and clever science in a petri dish in a lab. The other major science that I think signifies the way medical research in Oxford has matured over the years is in epidemiology. And so individuals such as Richard Dole established the science of epidemiology, understanding potential causal effects and consequences in populations of people, working out for the first time things that we now take for granted, such as the fact that smoking causes lung cancer and heart disease and many other cancers, and led to not just epidemiology as a core medical science, but the idea that large-scale clinical trials would be needed to work out whether new treatments are genuinely effective or not. And that's led to an understanding that, under, that the causes of disease can often be ascertained by observation before they are tested by new treatments in clinical trials. And Richard Dole's legacy is to establish in Oxford world-leading expertise in epidemiology and in clinical trials, which is now takes place around the world, even though it's led in Oxford. And in recent years, in the medical sciences, the University of Oxford has become the preeminent university in the world for medical sciences. And that's not, not something that we here in Oxford say, it's something that those people who generate world rankings say independently. And so we are number one amongst all of the other large universities in the world, including in the USA, for medical sciences. And that's exemplified by the broad range of different medical sciences in which we have world-leading uh, expertise in the basic sciences, the lab sciences, uh, and also all of the clinical sciences. And if you look now at a map of where we're sitting here, this is a bird's eye view of the city of, this is the city, city centre of Oxford, River Charwell, and here's now Headington, and you can see in the red dots, these are our hospital campuses. This is the John Radcliffe over here, the Nuffield Orthopaedic Centre, the Churchill Hospital here, uh, and the uh, Warnford Hospital. And you can see it more clearly 
Look how big these pink areas are relative to the area of the city. These are the hospital university campuses. They now take over an enormous amount of space in our city. And as I've mentioned, on these, um, on these hospital campuses, we have university research facilities that have been built up and which underpin some of our most outstanding world-leading basic discovery research. It's not happening in Oxford University labs down in the centre of town only. It's also happening on the hospital campuses. So you can see centres for uh, genomics, for biomedical engineering and cancer, for large-scale data and for orthopaedics, all located on the John Radcliffe and the hospital sites. And I've put them here. These in purple are University of Oxford clinical research facilities or basic science facilities that underpin clinical research. This is the Dunn School. It's still there. It's one of our most outstanding departments in the Medical Sciences Division of the University of Oxford. It's still generating world-leading basic science research, along with all 16 of the individual departments in the Medical Sciences Division of the University of Oxford. But 10 of those 16 departments have their base on the hospital campus. And many of those large departments have built multiple research facilities, which again host some of our most important research programmes. And the critical mass of individuals means that we now have an integrated National Health Service, University and Industry Health Sciences campus in Oxford. And it's embodied in the hospital campuses, one of which we're sitting in now. And this is large scale. Compared with some of the big cities in, in the UK, Oxford might be thought of as a rather small town. But in fact, because of the fact that Oxford hospitals serve the people of Oxfordshire and the region beyond, our hospitals host more than one million patient interactions per year. That's as big as any hospital in the UK. On these sites, we have 12,000 NHS staff. And even in the Headington campus, there are 5,000 people working on a daily basis to support research in these campuses. It's not just in Oxford itself. We're, of course, located within the Thames Valley. The University of Oxford is a major participant in some national resources, such as the national science uh, platforms based on the Harwell campus, just eight or ten miles south of Oxford, um, including the Diamond Light Source. Dorothy Hodgkin, I'm sure, would look back and see how world-leading capabilities like the Diamond Light Source enables us to understand how molecules are built and function at the atomic scale something she didn't have when she worked out the structure of penicillin, insulin and vitamin B12. We now participate in structures such as the, academic, as the Oxford Academic Health Science Network, which brings together all of the universities, all of the NHS organisations and some other partners across the whole of the Thames Valley region, enabling us to roll out healthcare developments and to work with company partnerships uh, much more seamlessly. And the Thames Valley region has 3.3 million people living in it. So that's a lot of people, a lot of healthcare need that's, that's necessary. So I just want to briefly speak about how important the Biomedical Research Centre in Oxford has been in, in catalyzing some of the partnership working that I've been talking about so far. The National Institute for Health Research, or the NIHR, is the part of the Department of Health or the National Health Service which specifically supports research in the National Health Service. And the NIHR has designated a number of biomedical research centres in England. In fact, there are 20 biomedical research centres in different places in England. And the Oxford NIHR BRC um, competed successfully uh, about 10 years ago now for a biomedical research centre designation. And that brings in uh, quite a large amount of funding into Oxford every year, about 20 or 25 million pounds of funding comes into Oxford every year from the Department of Health through the National Health Service to support research. And it supports research specifically in this very important overlap between the University of Oxford and the National Health Service, Oxford University Hospitals, NHS Foundation Trust both of which are huge organisations. So our hospital organisations 
have budgets of about £900 million pounds per year to um, underpin NHS healthcare in, in Oxfordshire. The University of Oxford Medical Sciences Division has a very large budget. So this is a relatively small amount of money compared with those enormous sums. And yet it makes a massive difference because it enables us to foster research in this very, very fertile area of medical discovery and innovation at the intersection between the National Health Service. And it drives this partnership. This funding from the NIHR means that we can take advantage of the scientific discoveries that are being made principally by our university researchers and help our NA and use our NHS clinicians and our patients to participate in research and make those discoveries turn into innovations and treatments that we can uh, apply to patient care much more rapidly than if we let these things happen separately. So in the last five years, for example, these are the sorts of levels of activity that the Oxford Biomedical Research Centre has been able to catalyse. Large numbers of scientific publications, many different research projects involving many different trainees, bringing in all sorts of extra research grants which we've been able to compete successfully for. Interactions with industry, more than five million people participating in clinical research studies over that five-year period. And most importantly, as I'm going to illustrate in the last part of my talk, tangible benefits for NHS patients. This isn't just basic science blue sky research that makes professors like me feel happy. This is about research that rapidly can make a difference. And that's exemplified by, for example, new spin-out companies. How do we get an idea all the way through to making a difference? If it's something that needs regulatory approval, like a new device, the way to do that is by spinning it out through a new company. The Oxford Biomedical Research Centre is organised into 20 different thematic areas, and if you can read in a circle, you can see that they cover most of the major areas of medicine, but we group them together in areas where these individual research programmes generate much more critical mass by working in the major areas of medicine, precision medicine, how to target treatments more effectively to the right patients at the right time. Technology and big data, how to take advantage of all the, all the latest developments in um, clinical informatics and how to use that data through digital health. How to deal with the, the big problems of what we call chronic diseases, the conditions that many people suffer from for many years. They're not necessarily ill at any one time, but over many, many years, all of us, as we get older, are likely to suffer from some of these common chronic diseases. And how do we continue to fight the global problems through um, fighting infection and better use of vaccines and other similar treatments? And so I just want to finish by illustrating how, through the Biomedical Research Centre, but more broadly through the university hospital partnerships, Oxford is very proud of some of the ways that it's being able to transform healthcare. So looking, for example, at antimicrobial resistance, this is the big problem going back to the penicillin era. Antibiotics are, of course, the victim of their own success. They, can be, they are so effective, they've been used so widely in so many people for so many different conditions over 70 years that many bacteria have become resistant to the effects of those antibiotics. And that's led to an arms race where new antibiotics have been generated, but ultimately it's been very difficult um, to stay ahead of the bacteria. And so research in Oxford has not only uh, led to new antibiotics through the 1960s and the 1970s, uh, including the cephalosporins, which took over from penicillin as frontline antibiotics, but now understanding using genome sequencing of bacteria, why bacteria become resistant to antibiotics. And rather than waiting to go through traditional diagnostic pathways involving culture of bacteria in a lab, using genome sequencing here to work out which bacteria it is, whether it has antibiotic sensitivity, and understanding the mechanisms by which bacteria uh, are no longer treatable uh, by antibiotics. And this has already led to some uh, world-leading research. The New England Journal of Medicine is one of the, arguably the world's leading medical journal. And you can see research from 
Derek Crook, Tim Pito, Sarah Walker and others here in the John Radcliffe use genome sequencing to work out, uh, uh, to give us whole new insights into the way that this common bug, Clostridium difficile, known as C. diff, it's, the, it's one of those common diarrheal illnesses that closes NHS hospitals. There's, there's, there's an outbreak and everyone presumes that this is being spread in the hospital and wards get closed, hospitals get given warnings, there's all sorts of measures taken place. And by genome sequencing, these Oxford scientists and Oxford clinicians worked out that most of the cases of C. diff diarrhoea in hospitals in Oxfordshire are not caught in the hospital, but they're brought in by people when they come in ill with other conditions. And so closing wards isn't going to help that problem. And that's because Mr. Smith and Mrs. Jones in the same hospital ward might end up with a diarrheal illness. But in fact, it turned out that the genome sequence of the specific bug that caused those two people's diarrheal illness was completely different in two thirds of the cases and only related in a minority of cases. World changing science that used two things. It used groundbreaking technology to sequence the genome of bacteria, but it also used the clinical acumen of people who thought about this as an NHS clinician responsible for treating infections in an NHS hospital. Not that different to the penicillin story of 70 years ago, but using modern technologies. In vaccines, Oxford scientists have a world-leading reputation, and that's in two, er two areas. First of all, Andy Pollard and colleagues uh, have contributed very substantially through clinical trials in <coughs> children in Oxfordshire to informing the current schedule of NHS vaccination in children. We take all this for granted that our children should be vaccinated, they have the right vaccines at the right age, and that gives them protection against a range of illnesses that used to be childhood killers. The vaccine schedule here has red crosses against it, and that denotes the vaccines where research supported by the Oxford BRC through the Oxford Vaccine Group is part of the national NHS guidelines. So 50% of the vaccines in the current NHS schedule of vaccination for children are underpinned by research done in Oxford by clinician scientists. But vaccines in Oxford goes much wider because Adrian Hill and colleagues in Oxford are currently working on developing a broad portfolio of many different new vaccines for a broad range of different conditions listed here, many of which you may think are not a major problem in Oxfordshire but some of them are problems in the UK. And of course, these are very major problems for global health across our world. In precision medicine, understanding the cause of disease and how to identify the right patient to treat with the right drug, genome sequencing in Oxford has not only been applied to bacteria, but of course to people. We now sequence the human genome and we use human genomes. This is the human genome set out in a circle. These are the 23 chromosomes and these little tiny dots which you can hardly see, they are millions of individual genetic variants that we all have. Oxford genetic scientists have led the world in understanding how common variation in the genome underpins common diseases. These are all the names of the genes that contribute to whether or not a person is likely to have a heart attack. There are now several hundred genes that contribute to that risk. And Oxford scientists have done the same in many different diseases, including diabetes, neurological conditions, dementia, etc. Understanding the genome in both rare diseases and common diseases has been pioneered by Oxford scientists. And now that genome sequencing can be done at relatively low cost on benchtop machines, the first human genome, remember, the Human Genome Project sequenced one human genome it took years and billions of dollars. It's now down to about $1,000, maybe a few hundred dollars to sequence a genome. And a human genome can be sequenced in hours rather than years with benchtop technology. How do we use that vast information? It's Oxford scientists who've contributed not just to the sequencing of the genomes, but through the so-called 100,000 Genomes Project in England now, how we interpret that data 
and how we use it to advise doctors and patients on treatment diagnosis. In precision medicine, those genetic diagnoses are not just about making the diagnosis, but this is gene therapy carried out by Robert McLaren in the Oxford Eye Hospital, correcting genetic defects in people with inherited blindness by delivering the gene into the back of the eye, correcting the genetic defect and restoring sight in people who would otherwise be blind with no hope of treatment. And digital health. By that we mean how do we use modern developments in digital technologies to improve healthcare. So working through the Biomedical Research Centre, engineering scientists, not medical doctors, engineering scientists teamed up with clinicians to improve the way that our nursing staff record bedside diagnostic signs. So we all have our blood pressure and our temperature and our oxygen levels measured when we're a hospital patient. Previously they were written on a chart at the bottom of your bed, probably forgotten. Those are now all processed electronically and digitally and that enables to extract new information about patients who might be deteriorating without us realising. It's an early warning system. It's been rolled out across all of Oxfordshire's hospitals. It's now been rolled out across our region um, and by the same type of methods using smartphone technology. The iPhone in your pocket, the smartphone in your pocket can be used to monitor blood glucose in patients who have diabetes and can send that information to the diabetes specialist nurse who can then keep an eye on many more patients who don't have to come to the hospital to clinics. Their diabetes during pregnancy can be monitored remotely, improving quality of life for pregnant women who have diabetes, reducing their need for insulin treatment, saving costs and, incre and um, improving the outcome of those pregnant women's pregnancy. And big data in Oxford, through the University of Oxford's programme, this is the so-called Big Data Institute, located on the old road campus next to the Churchill Hospital site, housing 150 scientists who are world-leading experts in the use of data. These are the sorts of data sets that underpin medical imaging, the data sets that underpin our genome sequence, massive amounts of data. How can we process that data? How can we learn from it? And the university's Big Data Institute is not built on some far-flung site. It's built on a hospital campus, and that's because the data scientists want to interact with clinicians. And the UK Biobank, um, in, uh, having 500,000 people, many of you in the audience might be participants in UK Biobank. It's led by Rory Collins, who's based in the, in the Richard Doll building in Oxford. And our imaging experts, one of Oxford's other great strengths, are undertaking comprehensive imaging in 100,000 of those Oxford Biobank participants, applying Oxford's leading expertise in, for example, MRI imaging to learn new aspects about the processes of common diseases, how we detect them, how we stratify those uh, common conditions and how we can learn more about the biology and ultimately treatments. So ladies and gentlemen, I hope that I've been able to illustrate to you this evening that the University of Oxford and Oxford University Hospitals partnership goes back even to the time of the inception of the National Health Service 70 years ago. In fact, it probably predates it by several hundred years. There are examples of how important that NHS University partnership has been for medical diagnosis and medical treatment over many, many years, exemplified by penicillin and many other discoveries. But in the modern era, the current excellence of the University of Oxford and the healthcare that we enjoy in Oxford and Oxfordshire is very much built on the health and strength of that partnership that underpins everything we do in medical research and the application of that medical research for the benefit of us as the patients of the NHS. Thank you.